This lesson is going to be about characters and we're going to just look at three kind of minor characters. Duncan's sort of major character, I guess. So one major character and his sons, Duncan's sons, Malcolm and Donald Vane, who are kind of minor characters. So it's just a little quick lesson giving you a bit of insight into these characters. And there's um, loads of different character lessons. So I've tried to split it up into chunks rather than just doing all the characters in one lesson because that was going to be like a three hour lesson. So if you're interested in this and this is something that you need, then feel free to watch the other Macbeth character analyses um, that are in this course. So yeah, we're going to just break down Duncan's character first. So we'll have a look at him. He's a king, first of all, so you can call him Duncan, but you can also call him King Duncan in essays. He's portrayed, meaning he's, he's shown by Shakespeare to be the rightful King of Scotland. So he's portrayed as the rightful King of Scotland. He's an honest, just a noble man. So he's someone who the realm is supposed to rely on. And there's this idea of the divine right of kings in Shakespeare's time, which is a context point. So this is that God has actually put the right person to be king in the place of the monarch. So they believe that um, the Christian God put the king on earth in order to reign. In, and therefore you shouldn't question his judgment and you shouldn't try and take power from him. So Duncan represents the perfection of the idea of the divine right of kings. He's a perfect king. Nothing wrong with him. He's a really lovely man. Everybody likes him. He does his job well. And it's really important to be aware of all those aspects of his character because you want to contrast those with Macbeth. So even if you don't get a question on Duncan specifically, you can then talk about how Macbeth does not represent the divine right of kings. He is not a good example of a king. He's not the rightful king of Scotland. So you can contrast everything that you know about Duncan with Macbeth. So his personality then is, is quite gentle. He's very kind-hearted. Um, I don't know why this is coming up as well. <laughs> Just gonna ignore that. Um, yeah, he's very gentle and kind-hearted. So he's he's a nice person. He's always really positive. He's a little bit too nice sometimes. Like he's really oblivious to the fact that anyone could be mean to him or want to kill him. He's really confused by that because he's, he's too much of a sweet man, but he's a really nice man. And you see that at many points, especially in the first act um, before the second act where he's killed. So in the first act, especially in like 1.2, for example, act one, scene two, you see him massively praising Banquo and Macbeth and giving them loads of kind of gratitude and um, showing his happiness with them and how well they did and in the fight against the traitor at the beginning of the play he makes the uh, bank Macbeth um, into Thane of Cawdor as well as Thane of Glance so he he rewards loyalty and he rewards um, people who are kind of kind to him or support him he rewards them justly which is shown to be the right way that a king should be so Shakespeare's kind of commenting on the nature of leadership and kingship and showing that a good leader justly rewards those around them and they don't rule through fear so people aren't scared of him and they're not just doing what he wants because they think he's going to do something bad if they don't they're actually really you know they have this positive cycle with him they feel like they're his friends and he respects them and they respect him and they're they're rewarded justly for their actions so that's really important from the point of view of how a leader should be or how a king should be and again when you're doing your essays you need to go into these themes so you have to go into like what makes a good leader what makes a good king because all of that is at the heart of Macbeth it's not just about this one time that this crazy guy tried to take over Scotland it's actually about how people are throughout history which is why we study it now even though it was written hundreds of years ago so with your essays, if you can always push into the themes and the ideas and the messages that are lasting and exist behind the story and behind the characters, that will always get you the highest grade at any level from GCSE up to university level. So when Duncan speaks then, I'm up to this point, feel free to scribble down anything that is useful for you, as with all scribbly courses. 
Um, yeah, so his speech is formal. He speaks like how we would expect a king to speak. So he speaks in rhetorical language, which is um, the kind of language that public speakers are trained in. And it shows his gracious character that he's aware of the formal conventions of ruling. Macbeth slips in and out of this. So again, especially if you're working with this at a higher level, such as A-level or university level, you can talk about the difference in the speaking style of Duncan versus Macbeth and how that demonstrates Duncan as a rightful, correct leader who's uh, properly in control over his language and properly um, kind of educated and uh, trained for the position of king and Macbeth who's language is a little bit emotional and sometimes all over the place and not as prim and proper and exact as Duncan's is. So it shows his gracious character and it shows his pleasant manner and it again shows his gratitude to people who are supportive of him. He does admit his weaknesses so he does actually talk about the fact that he didn't expect the attack from Cawdor when the king of Norway is uh, trying to take over the throne and then um, Cawdor, one of his own lords, turns against him. All of this happens just before the beginning of the play, so make sure you're aware of the whole plot, even what starts all the action off in Macbeth and what happens just before the play starts, because that's really important because it affects the time that we see Macbeth on stage. So he does admit his weaknesses, but he's still weak, he doesn't actually learn from them, and unfortunately Macbeth is too evil, the witches are too evil, there's too much darkness in the world, there's all these things that conspire against him and lead to his demise, his downfall. So arguably, he's too innocent and too naive. So it's interesting here with these two bullet points, what we're doing is creating kind of counter arguments, which is important if you get a character based question, that you can see somebody's character from multiple angles and you can see positives and negatives about them and you can kind of debate how we're supposed to interpret them because again that is something that gets you really high marks in an essay rather than just saying Duncan is like this we can say that you know he is a rightful king he's really well trained for the position and he's uh, very kind-hearted and supportive of his followers and his loyal subjects but he does have weaknesses but he does admit those weaknesses but he might still be too naive he doesn't actually fully expect to be uh you know betrayed by Macbeth and I, I think that's fair enough to be honest because <laughs> Macbeth is just almost given his life in order to defend Duncan so it doesn't make make much sense that Macbeth would suddenly then go and kill Duncan because he's just fought a battle on Duncan's behalf so I, I think it's a bit too harsh personally to say that he's innocent and naive but you can totally defend that if you believe that as well and there's different messages you can get out of his character depending on how you look at it whether he's um you know slightly weak or slightly innocent and so on so a modern interpretation is that Duncan is too innocent and naive um in Shakespeare's day people wouldn't really see it that way because they believe in this the divine right of kings so they wouldn't be like, oh, you know, Duncan's silly or blind to how people really are. They would just think that Duncan's right and it's the world that's wrong or it's other people that are wrong and evil. And it's not Duncan's fault. It's the fault of uh, the witches or Macbeth or Lady Macbeth or a combination of those. So the too innocent and naive interpretation, while it's a good interpretation, you have to be aware that that's quite modern. It doesn't go along with the context of how we would interpret Duncan's character at the time. And that's really important as well for getting top level essays out of your, your work that you've done. So you're aware of how context affects your interpretation. It's not just like you interpret it a certain way, but you're aware of how would someone interpret it at the time? How do you interpret it now? And are those similar or different and why? So the last final point that is also a contextual point they're both based on real historical figures and if you're studying at a higher level I would urge you to go further into that and look at Shakespeare's sources and look at how he manipulates them because um, in the original Macbeth was not an evil figure so in the actual history that Shakespeare was going off Macbeth was nice but he sort of twisted the whole story around to prove a point about his own time and about the nature of leadership and how you shouldn't question leaders.
So it's quite interesting when you, you push that context point further, but if you're just doing GCSE, you can just stop there and say that they're based on real historical figures and then analyze it at that level. So hopefully you're feeling a little bit more confident on Duncan now, and we're gonna just really quickly switch to looking at his sons as well. So his sons are called Malcolm and Donald Bain, not Donald Bain, I always write it wrong, so I'll just, I'll warn you guys as well because that's something that I always do. So Donald Bain, not Donald Bain. Um, yeah, they're both Duncan's sons. Malcolm is the older son and therefore he's the one that is slightly more involved in the action. He's the one that comes back at the end. He's the one that becomes king after Macbeth is dead. So he's the more important of the two. So you're not so likely to get a question on Donald Bain. You might get a question on both of them together or you might just get a question on Malcolm. So Malcolm is uh, the king after Duncan dies. And we realize this quite early on in the play. And Macbeth also realizes this just after he's been told he'll be king. And that's one of the inciting incidents. So that's one of the things that Macbeth gets angry about. And he's like, hang on, the witch has told me I'm going to be king, but suddenly Malcolm's going to be king. And Malcolm's, I'm not sure how old he is actually, but he's about the same age or younger than Macbeth. So in Macbeth's mind, you know, there's no chance of him becoming king if Malcolm's going to be king when Duncan dies. So that plants the seeds of doubt in Macbeth's mind. And again, if you don't get a question on Malcolm, you can sort of mention him in this way. If you have a question about Macbeth and what motivates him to commit murder or, you know, evil or supernatural, that kind of thing. You can always mention that he doesn't actually do anything until he hears that Malcolm's going to be king after Duncan and that contradicts what the witches have told him, and that makes him think, right, I need to act now, because otherwise, nothing, you know, if I do nothing, Malcolm will just be king instead of me. So that's a quite significant motivating factor at the beginning of the play. Um, after Duncan's murder, which is at the end of 2.1, before 2.2, so it happens off stage, really important kind of turning point in the story, so, Make sure you get that drummed in your head, 2.1. Instead of just, instead of me thinking like act two, scene one, or whatever, it, it seems kind of long to do that. So whenever I'm thinking of scenes, I just go 2.1, 1.4, you know, that kind of thing, because it really quickly gets it stuck in your head. So I recommend that as a tip, just to get kind of plot points in the order of plot stuck in your head. Just call it by the, the number. So 2.1, Duncan's murder or just after 2.1, before 2.2, Malcolm and Donald Bain panic because they weren't expecting their dad to die. They show arguably some weakness because they flee, but they fear that whoever killed Duncan is very likely to come after them next. And because no one really knows who killed Duncan and it's very surprising, they want to, you know, they want to keep their lives, so they run. And they split up as well. And they, they have a scene where they talk about this. So if you're interested in, in this particular scene, I um, can't remember which number it is, but it'll be in Act 2, basically. Middle of Act 2. So Malcolm goes to England and Donald Bain to Ireland. We don't hear that much more about Donald Bain, I don't think, or he's not that significant after this moment. So then it kind of focuses more on Malcolm. And after they flee, so this is a really important point, this third bullet point here, Macbeth uses this as a justification to blame them for their father's death. So this is a good point that you can bring in if you're talking about Macbeth, the character as well, because you can say he's quite opportunistic. He takes, he sees an opportunity and he takes it and he capitalizes on it. So he was gonna blame, um, you know, the guards for murdering Duncan which sort of works because, you know, they could just be drunk and crazy and they decided to murder Duncan or they could be paid by goodness knows who. But it's not the strongest um, alibi or the strongest kind of justification. And then he realises that when Malcolm and Donald Bain run away, it's much stronger to say that they actually killed Duncan and then they, they got cold feet or they kind of freaked out a bit and ran away. So he blames them and that prevents them from... Um, it, it kind of disempowers them so they can't easily get back into the country if everyone thinks that they're the murderers of their own father. 
So yeah, they become important secondary plot points involved in what Macbeth does in the main action as well, which is why it's worth spending a little bit of time getting to know them and what they do. So Malcolm is in England and Macduff goes to visit him. Um, this is around 4.2, there's all these 4.1, 4.2, there's these discussions between Macduff and Lady Macduff and she's like, don't go, and he goes, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and he's like, no, I need to, I need to protect my kingdom or, you know, kill the traitor and so on. So Macduff goes to England to try and convince, I think he's trying to figure out if Malcolm is actually a murderer or not. And then after, if he's not, which he isn't, he tries to convince him to come uh, back with a full army to try and kill Macbeth and restore Malcolm to the throne. So Macduff is a good character supporting the rightful King Malcolm. And he's a really important figure that contrasts with Macbeth as well. So have a look at my Macduff lesson if you're interested in him more. So Malcolm leads the army against Macbeth. He's part of all of those kind of choppy fight scenes at the end. He's the true king that returns at the end of the play. So he's a really important figure by the end. And really, he's sort of like the hero because he's the one that ends up king, even though the play doesn't focus on him. He focuses on Macbeth because Macbeth is the tragic hero and the play is a tragedy. So if it was just a normal play, Malcolm would be the hero. But because it's a tragic play, Macbeth is the tragic hero, the kind of broken hero. So yeah, Malcolm is restored as the rightful king of Scotland at the end. And he's kind of shown that he has a similar character to his father. So Shakespeare's reinforcing this point that we were looking at earlier on with Duncan, that a good leader is loyal and fair and kind and supportive of his subjects and grateful of help and all those different things that Duncan was. That's what we have in Malcolm too. And um, yeah, to zoom out, that is a reflection of what Shakespeare feels a good king should be doing at this time in his own political climate, which is very unstable. And it shows his support of King James, who's just been made King of England and was formerly King of Scotland. So make sure you're happy with all of that context as well, because that really helps you understand the characters and what the message is behind them. So that was a useful little lesson for you and um, you're feeling a lot more confident on these characters. Have a look at the other character lessons and the other Macbeth lessons if you feel this was useful. Hopefully you enjoyed it and um, thank you for listening. I'll see you guys soon.